All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of uh, Three Comic Money. This week we get Kari Andrews with us. Uh, so excited to have him on. Of course, you all hopefully recognize his name because he went freaking crazy about a month ago with that crazy dinosaur Batman cover that everyone fell in love with. But uh, if you obviously you probably know his name before that, so we're very excited to have him on with us. Uh, he's going to play guys. the game with us. Excited so. to be here. Yeah. Well, right. thanks for taking the time. So, Kari, we sort of talked about before the uh, the game and how it's going to run. So let's let's see if you pick your card, and we'll see what theme we have. Oh, right in, we're right into it. We're right into oh, yeah. it. All yeah. right. All right. Um, uh, I will choose the middle card. All right. Mike, middle what you got? As a middle I'll, child. I'll go left. All right. Then the guy gives me right. One, two, oh, my God. It's another. It's Everything's political these days. I can't. <laughs> I can't. I'm the centrist. Apparently. And the answer is the middle. Hey. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. And we, we have to throw your book up there, too. Because so. <laughs> it fits the topic perfectly. <laughs> oh, flashback. It's, let me tell you, I, 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 it's, it's, it amazes me how much I run into Spider-Man Rain on uh, internet articles, like, all the time, like, craziest Spider-Man story, like, whatever. It's all the time. It's, like, it's been, I think, almost almost 20 years or some crazy thing. Like it's, it's that, that, that book will outlive me for, for sure. Well, <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I love it. I love it. It's great. It's great. Yeah. So, well, I have to say that's probably one of my, one of my favorite stories too. So here we go talking about your story, but you also, it gets brought back up because I don't know if you last year, or yeah, it was last year or two years ago when Batman damned came out oh. and the, yeah. the bat wang. And my then buddy Lee Bermejo <laughs> tried to copycat. Oh, <laughs> but yours gets ignored. Like that book went to like a two hundred dollar book, and your book no, is just. It, it, at the time, at the time, it actually did make a. It did make a. a but there wasn't the collector's market was different then. Mm -hmm. um, another friend of mine, Kerry Nord, had a, a cr crazy Wolverine issue where there was a error by some <laughs> assistant editor who didn't understand a slur that he. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, oh, it sounds way inside uh, the book. And uh, yeah. one one thirty two. I can't remember the title. Yeah. Right. Yes. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, mine mine was interesting because I had well, <laughs> one of my one of my favorite books is uh, something called The Electro Lives Again. And um, in that issue, Frank Miller draws Matt Murdock's uh, <laughs> Billy Bat, and uh, and. <laughs> It was always I was I've watched, I read that when I was a kid and I was like oh, this is amazing this is crazy like it's 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 was just there it wasn't you know it wasn't erotic it was just like you know just there and it uh very European and so when I did Spider Man Rain I wanted to do the same kind of approach make an adult book kind of edgy but you know not like more European and I threw I threw in we can talk about this now but I threw in the the Spidey Peter's Peter Peter <laughs> uh, because. I I knew it would get kicked back if it was out of sorts. I you know, I tend not to ask permission. I tend just to do stuff, and so I just did that, and it got kicked back. And I was like, yeah, okay. I just thought, you know, it was just there. It was nothing erotic or anything. It was just there. Old man, old man's went, an old man's. <laughs> it's easier uh, to ask for forgiveness than permission. Yeah, exactly. to total. You cannot live by permission. Uh, <laughs> it's just not the way to roll. So it did get kicked back, and I did redraw it, and so there was. A fixed page but the assistant editor accidentally included the original page by mistake oh. and it hit the <laughs> comic stands and there then there was and then there, there, was a, <laughs> and then there was a bit of an a bit of a a thing and it helped it, it helped it helped sales of the book it was it helped i think it helped the it helped the book at the end of the day and it and I got my and I got my wish and the and then the corrected version was is the one that's in the trades and the reprints and, and all that yep. so it's kind of <laughs> interesting story. That, it was I felt bad because that assistant editor almost got fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was his yeah. fault, but it was really my fault. You know, it was that's like, like I, the uh, that's like the um the demons of Kathai uh Conan, the the cover oh, artist yeah. for that decided they were gonna do he just as a spoof a nude version of the cover and they printed it in the upcoming like the previous issue <laughs> coming next month conan number 23 the they, art is the nude, 
they printed the nude one in there. The real cover doesn't have that, but it's yeah. then they then of course Dark Horse released a nude one like as a limited edition. But in the Demons of Cathay number three, I think it is. It's sitting there in the back. I mean, oh, full nude. He's doing that, that Frank Cho stuff where he's like, I'm just going to draw them naked anyways. And then I'll put the clothes on for the printed version and sell the original with the, you know, like, <laughs> I like Frank a lot, but I think it's really funny that he does that. that yeah. Sort of thing. Did you guys see the Batvark spoof oh, today? I bought it today, actually. Did you? I couldn't find one. I was so mad. I saw so, it yesterday and I was like, eh. And then I saw it today. I was like, it's, yeah, it says penis right on the cover. <laughs> I wanted one. I really wanted one, but I couldn't find one. Uh, so, all right. Well, what actually, uh, you got you won, so you get to go first, and we get to talk about why'd you end up choosing uh, writer artist created books? Oh, they're just my favorite comic book creators. Those are the guys. Like I, you know, I was a fan in the in the eighties is when I really started reading, collecting comics, and at the time, it just was happened to be the heyday of Frank Miller and Howard Chaikin and all these writer artists, and there always was. There and there still is, I think. There always was a bit, it was a bit of a different flavor when the artist was the writer, whether they're good or bad, you know, whether those comics are good or bad, there still was a, a bit of a different texture to the work. And uh, I ended up just by happenstance, I bought um Nick Fury, Agent of Shield number one when I was a kid. Um, just it was on the wall and I didn't know what it was, and it was like it would look, it was a really old comic book, and I was probably 10 years old or 12, I don't know what. And I just, it was really ex not too expensive, but it was all my allowance or whatever. And I bought it and I just read it and was like so blown away by Jim Starenko writing and drawing. And it was like, it just shook me. And I was just like, well, this is amazing. So like, I've always really liked the writer artist. And I think any, any artist that hasn't written at least one thing himself is, uh, it got has to do it like it has to get off their ass and 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 write something just to, for the experience so well, you got spoiled if you started with Starenko. that's that's one hell of a start <laughs> doesn't get a whole lot better yeah than man yeah 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 well so the thing I about Starenko, he's he's just a he's also a bit of a an like i'm a bit of an out like i think every artist is a bit of an outsider right i'm a bit, every combo collector like yeah it's like <laughs> it's a cadre of outsiders and uh let me put it up for you so we can show it so they, oh, no, not this one. Pay no attention to that. We put them in the wrong order. <laughs> in that, uh, yeah. oh, there we go. I forgot I even picked that one. In in this, um, in uh, oh, in this, in this, in this Kaji of Outsiders, you even have the Outsider Outsiders, which is like a Jim Steranko. Some who came threw down, threw down like a baller, blew people's minds, and then went, you know, but he was doing magic. He was an escape artist. He published a magazine. He was like a, he was, a, you know, he just was a, an interesting guy that he, he, it's like he exceeded the bounds of, of the medium and the, in his time because he himself was exceeding the bounds of a man. Like he was just like, you couldn't define, you can't, still, you can't define him, you know? He's well, awesome. He's stuff. his own style. Like, yeah. people now, when you think of Steranko, I didn't even, to be honest, when you shared this book, I just like, oh, artist, yeah, Steranko's amazing. I didn't realize he wrote the book because because when I think of Steranko, he just had this style to the, the 60s and 70s that when he did it, I mean, I think he, he epitomizes the transition from the 60s into the 70s in art, in my mind, for comic books, just that especially this entire shield run, but like you look at the, those cap covers he did were just gorgeous as well. Um, yeah. Cause originally he was kind of a Kirby esque type artist. And then he started experimenting and doing his, doing some other things too. Yeah. He tells a story. He tells a story about going into, to get the job and, and talking to Stan Lee. I've heard him tell the story a couple of times and Stan Lee just said, uh, choose whatever title you want on the wall behind me. And he's like, well, I can't, I can't follow Kirby and people like that on these books. So I got to choose one that nobody cares about. So I'll choose, I'll choose shield. <laughs> I'll choose Nick Fury. Yeah. And well, I'll just take it. I'll make it my own. And Frank Miller did the same thing with daredevil. And yeah. uh, it's like, um, what's interesting is there is a bit lineage there between Frank Miller and Starenko. Like you see, the influence like you cannot escape especially when you see Strankel's black and white stuff like house of mystery or whatever he's doing like they're like you know frank miller was a fan <laughs> and i'm a fan of both of those guys so it's like i love how i love how the you can you can trace someone's tastes especially comic books especially artists 
visually you can kind of see like evolution before your eyes of like okay. this species infects this species infects this species infects this species you know no I, I mean i definitely agree like and i mean shoot i think uh when you keep bringing up frank miller like we all are diehard we love miller stuff of course i mean like when you talk about like just generationally i think uh mike why don't you go ahead and sh talk about one of yours yeah uh, yeah, this is my so my my first book I was going to share was was going to be this, which is for oh, the exact no. reason what you're, you're talking about. I mean, this this is the stuff that changed comics forever, right? I mean, I think if we look at this, and then maybe like the Burn Cockrum Claremont run of X Men, um, you know, I think that's probably where things got a little grittier. But th I mean, the stuff that's in that, that was in this run was amazing to me. Like I, I always refer to the the other other 181 which is daredevil 181 which is the death of electric issue mm. and i can still remember that panel being so shocking to me like her just up in the air getting stabbed by the sigh you know mm. uh, like brutal stuff but really visceral and 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 not not uh not in a way that i don't think it was in an offensive way at all it was in a very artistic way and yeah, it's pushing, uh, pushing some boundaries of the, of the yeah, time. Absolutely pushing some boundaries. Buy that, that, buy that comic book at a gas station, like a kid. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. I love it. Yeah, but but you're so immersive, and and it becomes this this arc instead of just like the 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 monster of the week, you know, kind of before that, which is what the Silver Age sort of felt like. Um, whereas in the Bronze Age, with guys like Miller and stuff like that, it, it turned into this this more textured tapestry of story artistic expression and the whole sort of the whole thing kind of kind of brought into to one one big unit and i think i think miller epitomizes that and, and especially for me i love daredevil i think it's mm -hmm. i think daredevil as a character is one of the most believable characters as a superhero and then what what frank did to it when it came on was pretty mixed he started to write before he started to do the art which is strange then he did some art without writing and then when i think it was 158 popped up was his first uh like dual so yeah. actually he did the art he did the art first in in a in a annual for S spectacular spider-man if i'm not mistaken uh, marvel team up uh 100 like yeah and then and then oh, when yeah, he dropped yeah. number 158 but this this 168 i feel like is sort of his breakout issue because it's obviously a key. i think that's that's i think is the one when he actually did both i can't remember which of the two he did in 158 when i was looking it up because i was considering that book too you know, but I think yeah. when, that is the one when with the electric coming in. That was his first doing both jobs. So I think he kind of yeah. split the job with somebody else. But I think there was kind of transition. Yeah, uh, before he took it over just by himself. Then he left in the one nineties and then came back to it again and did a couple of arcs in the two hundred and something or other. So, yeah, Kari, how how much do you, do you nerd out like this like we're doing right now? <laughs> or do you, <laughs> I know I, I I do I do I I have I have I mean I have to admit my my heyday of collecting is 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 a little is a little past me like i you know i still love comics and everything like that but uh but uh uh probably why i gravitate towards the the older books i just like you know i mean also like the writer artists have kind of gone away yeah. i don't know what, what the deal is. well i can tell you my theories on that deal but uh i don't know here's, here's what i love about the writer artists too is like look at frank miller jim stranko but jim stranko I, I heard a story from jim stranko talking about how uh how uh He's got kind of flaky, kind of like all the ar us artists are flaky, as you may tell by my rescheduling our thing and then be also being two minutes late. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever. We're the flaky guys. Uh, you got to pin us down a little bit, but um, no problem. Some story like he. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deadlines? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> flying Not over. Really. Um, uh, yeah. Some story where, where I forget something like he was a pain in the ass and no one liked him, but for some reason, Stanley really liked him and he let him do what this thing and he let him pick whatever he wanted to do. I remember that story that Stern Sturgo told him. I know Frank cool. Miller, and I know Frank Miller's a pain in the ass too. And I, I think it's like, I know Howard Chaykin's a pain in the ass. Like these guys <laughs> that end up writing and drawing, I know I could be a pain in, like I'm a very friendly pain in the ass, but I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm hard to work with sometimes a little bit, like not intentionally, but it's that weird. I think it's that, there is a personality that gravitates towards doing both. And you have to be a bit of a pain in the ass to want to do the two things, I think, because it's, it's your, you have to, pu you have to push hard enough to have people let you do it. Like, it's yeah. like, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird game. Like when I first told Axel, I wanted to, I first broke in to Marvel comics. And then within the year I was working with Axel, Axel just started there. And I said, Oh, I want to write, 
I want to write Endra. And he was like, Kari, listen. Templars <laughs> <laughs> like to want to write. It's actually, it's actually a lot harder than you might think. And so I just, uh, I just wrote and penciled and laid out, wrote and laid out a full issue that he could read. And then he was like, oh, this is pretty good. Like you can't, you always have to like, force your way in there like no one wants no one wants you to even ink your own stuff if you're a penciler no one wants you to color your own stuff no one wants you to write pencil ink and color your own stuff you constantly have to like push like a like just a little terrier if you're me but when you're a bull <laughs> like you're frank no like you know but some of that's uh like i can think of especially you're talking about artists being flaky on different things like i can think of some amazing artists that never met their deadlines and when you're talking marvel you're talking dc they start going we, we we say we're going to do this bi-weekly or bi-monthly or whatever and you're like okay you have to get it out in time so i can see they're sort of pushing back because uh i mean i'm just going to jump ahead of pete here because it goes long i don't know if you jump into the indies this non-player by nate simpson great book but he's only your pick doesn't matter pete. yeah, yeah we'll come back to it, but, it, <laughs> but this this book is a great book he's a video game designer he did his own book he did uh two issues and he it was a year and a half between issue one and issue two, he, he drew, and then it's like, and we're still waiting on issue three. Like he hasn't finished the yeah. story. <laughs> it's, it's and, hard, man. It's a lot of work. Like even just penciling comics is a ton. The workload is huge. Like the the man hours you have to put in just to pencil a book. Like they expect you to do about an issue in five weeks is what they say if you're just penciling. And if you want to ink your stuff too, like you have to find more hours. And like when I was doing Iron Fist, writing and drawing Iron Fist, I was getting up at five in the morning and just just like bunkering down and working as hard as I could until the rest of my family got up and then taking a break for breakfast and then push it. Like I just pushed pretty hard on that book and kind of, you kind of burn yourself out a little bit, but I really try to make my deadlines. Like I, I'm not always successful, but I, I'm not too bad, but I, it's like, you have to make your deadlines. Like it's, you it's have to do it. it. But if you, if you don't, you're going to be replaced. Like it's like, you know, like that's yeah. the deal. Fill an issue. But while you're doing that, you were also doing all those Ultimate covers, right? And the Ultimate Spider-Man covers was that the oh, same time? No, it was it was around the same time. I I when I did all the Ultimate covers, I pretty much just did that. I think okay. I may have I may have been or writing just did that. Stuff. You did like four different series, all the Ultimate covers. Like you yeah, did, for a year I did like for <laughs> four yeah four books. You for did Ultimates? Uh, was it Spider-Man? And <coughs> you did Ultimate Hawkeye, Hawkeye and, and Ultimate uh, X-Men. Ultimate yeah, X Men. They're all gorgeous. I'm, I was, I'm blown away by them. But I was just like, damn, he did how many covers? And so, uh, Living Weapon was like the year after, I guess. Then I can't remember. My life is a blur. I don't, I don't know what this. Sorry, I've had to do. I've done. Oh, the, I got Living Weapon behind me though. Yeah. Oh yeah. I there, love we go. there we go. I Thanks. love the Living Weapon. So, what was your first mark? You, you were talking about that book with Axel. Like, uh, what was the first one they let you write? Well, I um, so. Uh, so let me give you my quick way into Marvel. I I I pounded hard enough where they finally gave me a chance to draw half an issue of Gambit thirteen, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was given the what what came next? Ben Grimm and Logan that I drew that mm -hmm. Larry Hama wrote. One yeah. of my I mean, GI Joe is one of my favorite series of all time. So it was awesome. And uh, I already spoiled that one. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was it was my first time doing covers. And I, that first cover I penciled, I asked if I could ink it. They didn't want me to ink it. They don't want you to do that stuff, but somehow I convinced them I could color it. So I was able to like, I think cause I did some, I think I just colored a version. I could did a color rough and they're like, oh, okay, this will be okay. So I, I colored a version and then we, we got behind. So issue two or three, I can't remember. I ended up being able to pencil ink and color myself. And at the time back then you had to, even if you're working digitally, you had to FedEx in uh, stuff back and forth. So if you were behind and I could pencil and ink, I saved them two travel days alone, let alone an ink day. So I saved them three days by just me inking my own pencils. And if I could color my own stuff, the same thing, I saved them another three days. So, so I became quickly became like a known as a guy who could like in half the time complete a cover. If, if you let me pencil ink and color, because otherwise it's just at least two days transit or four days transit time through FedEx, let alone those days to do it. So I could save them six days um, and maybe give myself like a day and a half or two days. So in half the time I could, if they let me do that. And then with Axel, I, um, I, uh, I, 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 um, 
I like to experiment all the time. I like to try new things all the time. I wanted, I always wanted to oil paint and I didn't have any oil paint, but I had my Wacom and it came with some software that had like an oil paint ish thing. Mm -hmm. So I just, on a whim, I just digitally painted a cover, not knowing how he would respond. But I just, again, you just do it. You don't, you don't ask permission. You just, and, and he was like, this is amazing. He really liked it. So I was able to do that. And then that's when, you know, once my value, I could feel my value increasing. I started asking about writing and drawing. And then I was given both a, a story in Tangled Web by Axel at the same time as I was that. given the one shot from another editor, an editor I had known before, uh, Smitty, Brian Smith, the manga Spider-Man, uh, manga vs. Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was given those jobs. Mm -hmm. So I was able to break in as a writer and artist from two separate editors. And just knowing that I could, then I knew I was a writer artist because I could, if I had two separate artists al allowing me to like, write and draw, then I knew I could, I could do that. And, uh, and then uh, just kind of went, kind of went from there. They turned out, they turned out well. And, uh, and, uh, then I think the next thing I did, the road drew was Spider-Man rain, I think. Nice. Yeah. Cause I was, just, I liked Spider-Man tangled web and Batman did the same thing at the same time of this, where random artists and random writers just got the, you got one issue. It was, you had to create like Darwin cook does one. Uh, Paul Pope does one. Like, all of mm. you guys who just had one shots in there. And I think Batman's version was Chronicles. Batman Chronicles was like one shot guys just doing little stories here and there. It, I just, I, I feel like that's missing from today's comics. Like you don't get the series and maybe, and maybe there's a reason. I mean, it just seems like yeah. you don't get that opportunity as an artist slash writer to try. Yeah. Well, they're doing it now with the, the Wolverine uh, stuff. The, and the Wolverine, um, is it black, I Wolverine or the like black, white, and red? Or I don't know what it is. It's like, uh, oh yeah, it's about to come out. The... It's about it's, it's not out yet, but it's like guys are talking yeah. about their about their books. So yeah, I you know when you're when you want to do both jobs, you look for those things. You look for those opportunities. Um, like but I used to love them too. Uh, collecting, I love them. Um, I think they're hard to keep the sales up mm -hmm. because retailers never know the writer, they never know the artist and the story is different and the characters are different for every issue. So I think yeah. when the market itself is healthier, when there's more sales globally, I think he, there's more opportunities to do that. Unless you have like a tier one character like Wolverine and you're doing a, an event thing like they're doing now, I think you can swing that, but they never, they never last because yeah. the sales I think are just that they don't, they're hard to keep up. Yeah. Cause I mean, and especially today, I mean, you become one of the cover artists in demand. Like it's, it's just one of those like it's so hard because people buy books and never open them. I mean, yeah. Well, it's weird. Well, here, well, here's what happens. Here, let me tell you what happens is if you create if you're a comic company and you're like, listen, we don't. These artists took all our money, went and formed their own company. We're gonna stop promoting the artists. Let's stop promoting the writers. Okay, great. Hey, look, this writer can do five issues a month, and that artist can barely do a one a month. And now, if we build a fan base based off the writers, this will be great. And then the Oh, people start the writers start getting a bit overvalued, like the artists once were. And once you overvalue the writers, well, there's less money for the artists. We well, don't want to get a tier one artist to. You're already paying all that money for your tier one writer, so you're going to start hiring substandard artists to draw the insides of your books. But no one likes those artists. <laughs> That's artists are like they're okay, they're passable. But where do you put your tier one artists? They just go to the covers because the covers you get paid way more. You can focus on one image and you can really like do a thing. Like you can really like experiment and do a thing and like make a mark. And like, it becomes very attractive for a good artist to be allowed the time and a little extra money to work on a cover than the insides. But what happens then? Well, collectors, I'm a collector. I know half the reason I read comics is for the art. Like probably 70% of the reason I read comics is for the art. So when you're collecting artists, and those artists are no longer on the insides. Well, that creates a cover speculator market, and because you you still want that art, you still want that. I want that Travis Sheree or whoever, like Josh Middleton or whoever. Like I want that, and it becomes like that's the thing. And then the inside is like a bonus. Maybe you read it, maybe you don't. It's like a bonus. It's a weird. It's a weird reversal, but I think it's going to start going the other way soon because you know these are just trends, and this trend will expire. And then all I think all those good artists. Are going to be back on the inside. That's my hope. My hope is if, well, it's not even my hope. I, I I believe that once the sales start, like remember, 
when I broke into comic books, just to sidetrack, when I broke into comic books, the editors I would meet were like, listen, there won't be comic books in five years. This was in 1999. <laughs> Find a different job. Like, but I just wanted to do comic books so bad. I didn't care if the market was imploding. They're like, fine, do a video game. And I, this wasn't just one editor. I hear this again and again from different editors. You're really good. Find a different job. There won't be comics in five years. I broke in the worst time in comic books. Marvel had declared bankruptcy. Like a month after I started working, there was letters going around to like the Marvel had to turn their lights off in their offices after seven o'clock or something like that. Like just, they were saving every penny they could. And, uh, but what happened then is you had all this creative energy because the comics were slumping so bad. That's when you had Marvel Knights. That's when you had Axel do his thing. That's when you joke us how to do his thing. You, you empowered top tier writers and artists just to do crazy stuff and just to like try things. The ultimates came along. Mark Miller came along. Like that was a renaissance for comic books. And I think it helped again, you know, save the industry was the creative power. So I know yeah. we're kind of in a bit of a kerfuffle right now in the comics, but I think it's, probably going to be ultimately a good thing. Like I think if the sales dip down a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, I think the floodgates will be open for like people who love comic books and are in there to do their thing will be allowed to just do a thing. And when you empower, regardless of the payment, a, a great writer and a great artist and give them like, just do a thing, just make a mark. Yeah. I think just we're on a corner between a Renaissance and comic books like you haven't seen in 20 years. That's what I think. So those I, I really hope you're right. It's really yeah. nice to hear. It's really nice to hear a positive perspective on that for once, because everyone's, you know, not everyone. I shouldn't say that. Many people are being very negative about where they feel the, the industry is going to go. And and I'll admit, I've been I've been one of those people from time to time. I write two articles a week, and uh, you know, my article is based on just the appreciation of good, fun art artists that I like. That and the, they're worthless books. Pete's article is really similar, and as a matter of fact, Chris's article to a large degree is similar as well, because we're really appreciators of our favorite artists. And it's hard not to be negative about what's going on in the industry for for us as collectors right now. You know, where you know, I love getting myself a Bill Sienkiewicz cover. I love him, but man, I miss him in the interiors. Oh, you know, like yeah. man, what I want, I want him to do a whole book like like New Mutants. You know. Yeah, but but that's just not the way of the way of the realm right now, and, yeah. and uh, I hope it goes back that way. It'd be really great if it does. And how tough is it when he's doing an incentive cover that's like one in fifty or something? So you got to pay a huge premium to get that art that you yeah. love because he's doing the top end or well, just buy the damn original at that point. <laughs> in some cases, maybe not but, for sync, but for but other people. Do you think the? I mean, DC and Marvel, the big two. Then Image was sort of number three, but. I've noticed, and because, and you're actually with AWA and Axel's thing, like all these little uh, one-offs. The image is no longer the big boy, the the number three tier in my mind because they only do two to three books come out a week, maybe from Image. But like AWA, you guys are doing you one or two, three books. Uh, I mean, shoot, we we all went out and bought the cover you just did for Year Zero. Oh my yeah. freaking goodness! This thing is absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, mine this is the other ridiculous. Room. It's unbelievable. I know you've seen it because you made it. I mean, <laughs> what in the world, man? Me, First of all, it's twisted and macabre as hell. <laughs> and that's awesome. But what a gorgeous cover. Like the, the dichotomy of beauty and, and horror in the same cover is ridiculous. And I, look, I, I'm not being like fanboy guy, but this cover is insanely good. good. But <laughs> you know, half that credit goes to a Axel, to be honest. Like Axel and I are a good team because I, when we first started working together back in the Spider-Man, like I remember my first one of my first Spider-Man layouts, I was really excited to do the cover. And I did like, I, I don't know, a bunch of layouts, but they were really over complicated. And then he was like, just do something sim simple. And, um, and so I did, I mean, that's all the direction it was really, but, but, uh, I, I did. And that was one of my very first Spider-Man covers of him riding a lightning bolt, a bit of a dark night, but it was still painted, still digitally painted it, it, uh, it <coughs> a bit different, but, uh, like he's a good, like when you, when you are an artist, a good editor will inspire you towards good work. So, you know, he had a brief when we did the year zero covers, he wanted um, international covers, postcard covers, the beautiful co covers, but something odd about them, you know, like, like, so that I want to know your version of this story, because he told us the version <laughs> about this cover. Oh, yeah, and it, I was like, I grabbed it too. I was looking for we it. We want to know how you came up because he said he drew you a picture 
And it, what you came up with was nothing like the picture. You know, um, I don't. Re- I don't remember. I so 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 with the surfing cover. That was something Axel pitched me, like surfing cover bodies wow. in the ocean. That was a, a specific thing. Where I was like, okay, like I'll do that. That's cool. Um, the picnic cover. Uh, he said it was like a camping tent. Yeah. He said, oh, right, right, yeah, yeah, right. no, 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 yeah, yeah. So he was like, he was like, yeah, yeah. So people, people are it's night. There's, there's a, a, a flashlight on in the, in the, in a tent, and you can see people in a tent, and maybe zombies are outside. Uh, and I wasn't so interested in that, in that idea, but, uh, <laughs> but what I did was I, I followed his initial brief, which was like serene beauty landscape, and you know, I'm a family. I got a family, like a picnic in the park with your family. It's like you know, sounds really fun, and then. <laughs> And a and guy burning have, in the background. Well, yeah. originally had a, just a just a zombie in the background, but it seems so undramatic to just have this lumbering <laughs> guy just look like a homeless guy in the park. I thought, well, what if he's on fire? <laughs> and then I thought, oh, that's fun. And then I just I just like unleashed the smoke gods because I just wanted more. Like I wanted it to you to see him. Yeah. And so the smoke just went out. Of, I put too much out of control. It's too much. But <laughs> that was the thing where it's like, where it's like I, you know, the cover notice though. That's what I like about it. Only the little one yeah. notices. Well, here my my my. I have a theory about covers where like my job as a cover artist has nothing to do with the story inside. Nothing to do with what what that arc is. Nothing to do with anything. If you can find inspiration there, great, amazing. But the only, especially in the stores, the only job you have as a cover artist is to get that person to pick up that book and open it that's it your job's done if i do that just with a cover what's this pick up open that piece out i did my job like i earned my money so <laughs> so you know it's like sometimes the covers are st- like josh is one of my best friends he has the same idea with his wonder woman covers right now like he could give a you know does not <laughs> care you know like he's doing his thing and yeah. he's so good right yeah it's beautiful yeah. This you thing is unbelievable. The two, the fact that these two covers came out in the same week is almost unfair. Because I have to write an article where I choose my favorite one. And I'm like, really, you guys? Are you skipping? Real? You couldn't do these two weeks apart. Because <laughs> Josh is one of my best buddies, and we I, we've known each other forever, and we're often we often stumble across as we both do a lot of covers. We often stumble across where we're like, you know, a website will feature both of our covers at the same time, and it's it's like a fun. He's one of the only guys like really is like a process junkie like me. Like I love trying oils trying watercolor trying acrylic trying an airbrush trying you guys two different styles the two yeah oh yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah complete different styles but he's the only one i can talk to about just nerd out about like art supplies <laughs> well okay so is this all digital or is this this is digital so okay. year zero is just i mean it's digital painted yes but there's no real media component at all so so i was one of the first artists to to paint digitally at marvel mm-hmm. and um at the time it was new and it was a way for me to stand out a way, a way for me like you know exactly. peacock but mm-hmm. now everyone does digital so i have retreated and i often do like real media covers right now so like that dark nights the uh, dinosaur cover was um airbrush on paper which <laughs> no one can do anymore like people have forgotten the technology so i just see it as like well that's what i'm gonna do Wait, now. so you have like a legit airbrush gun or whatever like oh, oh yes it's right it's right <gasps> it's right over Right over there. So, you can you make me a t-shirt there. that says like CBSI? Car- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was airbrushing today a, 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 a thing. Like I, le- I like, I love it. Like I love, like I love just, go- I love going against the grain. Like when I see 10 people do this, I like, mm-hmm. I love trying to find a, th- a that. Yeah. Now, Josh is the same way, which is why we get along. Well, you could tell, you could tell Josh you won you won this week because you you were the you were the cover you're the cover fire winner on our site. Well, I was gonna leave this podcast immediately if I didn't win. So. <laughs> but so were you? Is that more because you because you're Kari Andrews? I mean, is that like because I can do what I want to do because people like my stuff? Like I can experiment more. Like I'm just curious. Like would you be comfortable experimenting with airbrushing if? you hadn't been as successful with the digital and all the other before it's, I mean, there is a little bit of that. There's a little bit of like safety. Like I've been working for so long and, and people will employ me even if I fail, but I, I had these weird instincts. Like when I was breaking in, like when I did my digital painted cover, that was not back then. That was not a thing. Was that the tangled web? Was that half digital? The first one I ever did was, Oh yeah, yeah, that was digital. That was uh, that was not my best work, but th- pre-, pre that I did a Spider Man cover where Paul Jenkins run where he's just there and he's got these wires mm-hmm. in his head. And I think the one that 
printed first was Spider-Man against a black and there's a lightning bolt behind him mm. kind of in mm. flight. But back then that was a, that was a big risk. Like that was a big experience because yeah. no one was doing that. And so yeah, I knew if I had asked, they would say, uh, probably not, but I just did it. And I just, I always have this, so it's almost a self-destructive urge where I just want to just want to do the wrong thing and just, but do it and make it, make, make people like it. So <laughs> I did a, I did a cover for uh Deadpool kills the Marvel universe. I love those covers. The very yeah, first time I did oil painted cover. That was the second oil painting I had ever done in my life. The first one was just a, a like a, a really bad, Oh, but the first one I did was actually another cover for Marvel Comics. It was like a <laughs> like, really bad, but I did it and it got paid for it. But I always find like I'm I'm so busy I can't. Josh and I have different. Like Josh will test every paper, everything, and he really is like a scientist when he when he. But I'm just more of like a I have an urge, and then I just want to do it. And if I don't make it a real job, I won't ever do it. So I learn, you know, if I learn to do. I learned to do by doing. So if I, I have an urge to do something and I have to do it, and sometimes it usually it's okay. Like usually, usually it works out. Sometimes it doesn't, but usually it does. Yeah, the pressure's good. Pressure is good. Like you need, like you want pressure. Like the reason why people have their performance best in the Olympics is only because the pressure in that crucible of failure. Like, you, like I live for that. Like I want to be on that <laughs> razor edge. I mean, you ever heard this? Like, okay, so there's this idea that if you're a gymnast and you do the flawless routine, right? Hit every move, boom, boom, boom. You make it look effortless. You're so good. It looks effortless. How do you beat that? You beat it by living on that edge of failure. If you hit those same moves with the same perfection, but you embed with it a chance of failure at every turn because you're pushing your body so hard, that's like, I want it. I want that. Like, that's what I tried it. And I almost- That's why we all hate Superman. <laughs> yeah. Because he is. can't fail. So he's boring. It is. And that's why I love <laughs> Spider-Man. And when Spider-Man gets his costume beat up and he's fighting Venom and it's like half ripped off his body, those are my favorite images where he's just like, he's just surviving off of grit and he just somehow manages to do a thing. Building. Oh, yeah, man, I can't get enough of it. So like, I'm always trying to, like a deadline, I love deadlines. I'm always battling them, but like that edge of chaos and order, like if you can just walk that razor edge without becoming boring and, and I've done that or falling victim to like, destruction like that's when you make when i make my best work is when i just like somehow survive and just like push so do you juggle this at the same time direct movies too yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah i do yeah 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 so, and, and i started directing tv a couple of years ago four okay. years ago nice uh, so peter i'm curious i want to see we'll pull up one of your books i just want to see one of the ones that you like because i want to i want to hit on your gi joe pick early he's later. like he's like we're 40 minutes into this thing and you yeah, haven't like, do my first book yet <laughs> all my segues are gone i had a segue right go talk i had a little bit i gotta work towards it whole image make you work harder it's the pressure yeah the crucible of pressure i'm gonna i'm gonna use that i'm stealing that from kari yeah man <laughs> Going back to the whole idea, like when the artist was, you know, they took over, the artist was king. I mean, we all go back to, you know, to Image. I'm a big Jim Lee fan, and I really considered going with Wildcats with this pick, but I just couldn't. I had to go with Todd, so I went with Spawn because it's it's Spawn. I mean, it, it is what it is. It is the cornerstone, basically, of Image. As much as I loved, you know, Jim Lee, I mean, Wildcats is what it was. It was X-Men Light, but... Spawn, it's still going. It's still going strong. So I had to go there, or, you know, writer, artist. And again, going back to one of the segues when you're talking about like inspiration, like I remember that time when Jim Lee tried to do his Frank Miller, like the Sin City, and he tried to do yeah, his version where Jim Lee was paying. I, I love that stuff too, but it was an obvious, like you can see the inspiration as it goes through. And I love it when artists try different things. Like that's why I do, I, I love your work because I, you try different mediums and like your Spider-Man, like the, the manga Spider-Man looks completely different from some of the, you know, the digital work that you do. And when you brought up Josh Middleton, he as well, he does a lot of different, it's like a lot of different vibes of what he can do from photorealism to something more, more cartoonish to it's, I love art and I love the prop following the process. 
Yeah, I like to be surprised by an artist. And, and you, you, the two of you, it's great that you guys are friends because you're the two that continually pop up that way. You'll see a new thing and you're like, I don't recognize that art. Wait a minute, is that Middleton? Uh, what? Yeah, well, he's even, <laughs> he's even, he's stopped signing his covers, I, I believe, like a, like a year well, you ago. Cha you change your signature. Like I go back through them, like one's digitally cut on there and then the next one's you got the signature and then, yeah. then you had yeah, the, your dot com for a while. Uh, someone bought that, that I, I thought that expired. Someone else owns it. Right oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah, when I, yeah, I, I'm I, like, I, yeah, I'll change my signature when I'm, when I, yeah, there was a, <laughs> yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird, like, it's a weird signing stuff is weird. And uh, yeah, I've made some weird specific choices about signatures on specific projects. And uh, I don't know, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. But for us that love art and identify, it's so hard because we're like, Kari, okay, wait. Because like, to be honest, like we went through, I'm like, I, I knew you from Rain. Like, that's where I yep. knew your stuff and, and Immortal, the living weapon and all that. Because that style, when you do your interiors, you're, a lot of it's similar. <laughs> When you do covers, you get to play, like you've said. And I'm like, oh, I didn't realize you did the entire, like, I mean, I, I know you don't follow the collector market quite as much. But your freaking um, Miles Morales run of covers, oh, yeah. oh, they went ballistic Gosh. from being like $5 books to $100 books, just like your uh, death oh, metal. From after, from after Spider-Verse? The... Well, no, yeah. after actually after the uh, protest, the George Floyd. Oh, yeah, that too. That too. You had yeah. the yeah. Yeah. cover. Upcoming PlayStation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Right. So it's it's funny how the market in the, the markets, like you said, we, we feel like the market's going to die at any moment because of, OK, people are just buying it, trying to make money and all this stuff and not actually ever opening a book and reading. But um, it's it's interesting talking to you, talking about the process of getting the writing, the inking, the color. I did not realize it would be FedEx back and forth. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not not anymore, but that back then, like I was, you know, I, I remember I was one of the first to try to email a cover and back then I had to break the cover up into color channels because I could only attach them to emails. And at the time emails were like super low. Mm, yeah. So I had to email a cyan channel, a yellow channel, the magenta channel, the black channel, and then they on there and had to push them together. And it was like a <clears throat> it's like a whole as a whole uh as a, as a whole wow, deal. So going, nowadays all you do is okay do I want small, medium, or large. <laughs> yeah. and, and, the, and then if it's yeah. too big, I do the drop box and drop it in. The, yeah, exactly. You know, but I remember when I was a kid, like in my in my peak collecting rage, um, the collectability was huge. Like, uh, like um, often it was if you didn't if you weren't at the comic shop on Wednesday and you'd missed that book, it would be sold out, and then the stores would buy them back from you. And put them and mark them up and put them back on the stand so you could maybe buy that issue from last week at like tw you know ten dollars instead of th two dollars or whatever it was, like it was fun. Like it's it's fun to collect and it's fun to see things go up in value. And I th actually think I think that's like I think that's part of what makes comics interesting and why digital books are nonsense. To be honest, like I <laughs> yeah. I'll I don't live near a comic book store anymore, so I will often read it digital books just yeah. to read them and they're there. Or, but um. The part of the fun of comics is that it's a collect. It's like a collectible market, and I think the cover market will expire. That trend will go away. But then those, when it does, the people that drive those collect that collectability will then be on the insides of the books again, and the collectability will renew. I that's 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 what I that's what I believe. And all those books that went up in value when I was a kid, they stayed in value, and they've stayed. They've made a lot of them, not all of them, but yeah. most of them have maintained their value. And it's you right. eBay, try to buy them on eBay, try to buy Dark Knight first print on eBay. It's like, what? You know, it's never gone down in value, even yeah. if the market has gone up and down. The collectability has always maintained its value. Well, and right now, the explosion of original art is crazy. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah, that is oh, another thing. Yeah. But, like, I mean, I'm fully with you. Like, I think of the stories, like the Frank Miller, like what Mike brought up, and you just brought up Dark Knight. Like, those are the stories we all probably, I mean, shoot, I, I own the copies and I own the trades, like, cause I want to read it. Like I, I, I don't touch my copies. They stay right. in my box, uh, but I have the trade and I want to read the trade because I, I mean, speaking yeah. of like, cause I mean, shoot, you talked about, I have the trade of your book here. Like I, I have it in paper and then I also have it cause I like reading that story. Um, but we do that. Like Mike's a diehard Red Sonya fan. Um, he, he's so excited. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing a segue for him cause he has to show you 
his he's a big huge red Sonya fan so he wants to show off his red Thor, uh, frank thorn uh, oh yeah this thank you for see he gives me a transition that's awesome i mean I, I love i love that stuff because it's just fun and and frank frank took over red, the red sonia stuff back in the 70s and he i you know before that he was he did art for playboy and he was doing like you know sexy pinup stuff nude stuff and i think he always felt like he wanted he you know he wanted red sonia to be naked sometimes so he just when well, he just decided well i'm just gonna move on. i'm gonna do my own version i'm gonna do a blonde red sony i'll call her gita and i'll make her nude when i want to and so that was the second my second choice this week was and this is the first time she appears in 1984 magazine but it's just i mean really if you look at it it's just it's just red sonia yeah um, that's awesome. and you wouldn't even know she's blonde other than that he did a few <laughs> color covers but you know i don't know i don't know we're on tails we're on tails i'm not supposed to show nudity but i mean like right away page Art. two of her first appearance she's not wearing clothes yeah so awesome. um but I love that because Frank Frank was when he was doing Red Sonia, he was doing covers, interior pencils, inks, and colors. Wow! On all, and and lettering on all those on all the issues that he did. And I'm like, that's that's just insane to me <laughs> that you great. would. But he loved the character so much and made it his, and then turned around and you know and did his fun version to kind of mesh his two things together, his Playboy and his and yeah. his Red Sonia together. So I I love that stuff. It's fun. It's silly. It's completely campy. There's nothing serious about any of it, but it's sort of like sword and sorcery with a little sex pepper thrown in there, uh, which is kind of I don't know. It's just fun for me. It's it's no, sort of my uh, it's my dessert. I um I, I like uh, I'm obsessed with heritage auctions. So I'm, every week I'm like I check out the original art stuff, and you know I bought a little bit on my wall. I've got it's a couple things like some stuff from I picked up from there, but um the Frank Thorne stuff is always on there, and it's always like you know it's very uh des desired. It's like a yeah. you know he made he made his mark for sure. I have uh, I have my my Grail. I just picked up a couple of months ago. Chris knows about this. Pete, I'm not sure if you know about this one, but I got the entire issue number nine prelim book, every page and the cover from Frank, with Frank's and Roy Thomas's notes in the margins and everything. Uh, uh, it, it's it's in, I mean it's awesome. it's my it's my prize. It's I think it's my prize in my collection for my original art anyway, just because it's the whole book, um, every page, every panel. That's uh, awesome. All, it's really it's really cool. Yeah. So when we talk about like Kari, like do you get paid for if you're a color inker writer and all that, do you get paid or is it just, Oh, we're just going to give you this. I'm just, I mean, you don't have to talk about how much you get paid. I'm just more like, I'm curious if they just yeah. lump some you. Do they add no. on if you get well, these? It, dep it depends. So at Marvel and DC, it's so, it's so regimented. You, you get paid per job, per task. Okay. And then when, um, yeah, generally you get paid per task. Like I have worked where I've gotten a, a lump sum knowing I'll be doing everything, but it's still like what they paid me for the lump sum was the value of those tasks put together. So, okay. so that, there, there's no bargain like, Oh yeah, well, we're just going to, if you do both, I, I'll pay you a time and a half. There's no savings. There's no savings in, in, uh, in the writer artist game. The only time there's savings is if you're like, um, if you're like a, a dark horse or a boom mm -hmm. and you're like, um, you're maybe you're giving a, uh, someone an opportunity they haven't had before. Maybe you could just give them a lower rate just, just for the, and you'll often yeah. have guys who like, who really like working with a publisher and will work for lower rates just to work with that publisher. Uh, but you also have to be, you know, there yeah. has to be something in it for them. It has to be a barter, but at, at Marvel, it's like, it's like, um, it's weird because even if you, it's not weird, it's good, but it's like, even if you, if you want to add an extra page to your story, it's like, you have to negotiate. Like, even if you put like, Hey, I want to do a page that's just black with just a little tiny thing in there. And I know it, I know it's not budget. Can I just do that? And they're like, no, like you have that costs money. So when I did my book uh, for image comics, Renato Jones, I just as a choice, I filled it with double page spreads of just whatever I want, like an eyeball or just nonsense, things I wouldn't be allowed to do at Marvel DC because they wouldn't want, I wouldn't have the story room because I was getting paid per page. And with image, 
I was getting paid as a unit. So okay. I could, no matter, I could do whatever page kind I wanted to do. So I just was filling it with weird double pages just to explain. So just to is that, that's why you created your own ads. Like I love that book because <laughs> I opened it up and I go, there's a freaking, oh, no, it's Renato Jones in the ad. Or it's a, like, it was, I love that. Like I went and bought every one of that first run of Renato Jones just because it was so just not the norm. Like, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it was your style, which I love your style, but then it was like, this is just, you open up and there's an ad, but it's Renato <laughs> in the ad. And then, yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, that, that was fun. That makes so much more sense to me because I'd never seen a book that had no ads. Well, had ads, but didn't have. Well, I originally I wanted ads. I was like, where have all the advertisers gone? I was like, I was like, I'm going to find me some advertisers when I did Renato. <laughs> I'm going to sell my own ads. I'm going to find those ads. And then I quickly realized that like, I don't, I do, I don't even know who to talk to. And like, I don't have time to find ads. So and I don't... For image that's like to find people to add the advertising you. Like... Well, well, image, you just fill up the book with whatever you want. So I okay. thought, Oh, what an opportunity to like, Call up Coca Cola and you know get them <laughs> buy some ads for me, but then that was that wasn't going to happen. I think I, I think I emailed a couple people, a couple companies, and I was like, "This is this is weird. Like, I don't want to spend my time doing this." And then I just kind of got in this weird zone of like, "Well, I used to read Adbusters when I was in art school, and they had all the fake ads of like making fun, satirical fake ads." And I thought, "Oh, I, I'll do my own ads. I want because I want like I want like." Gucci and I want like, you know, <laughs> Calvin Klein. Like I want like fashion ads in this weird magazine about elites and money and you know, like I, so then I just started going crazy and like make making my homages to like Calvin Klein obsession or whatever. You know? It's fun. It's like, that, like, it's like that famous uh, uh League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, is yeah. with the ads in the back, the Marvel douche ad in the back that they haven't taken. Oh, I, I missed that. <laughs> it was a, another recalled book because it, it had Marvel's <laughs> It had Marvels in the ad, and then Marvel got upset because it wasn't a Marvel book. But it was a real thing, though. Yeah, it was a real ad. Like. It was a real ad. Yeah. He found. Yeah. It. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> he found a real ad. It just yeah, happened. The the word. Oh, he didn't even yeah, make there it. There was a company back then that did, they made that there's, product. There's that another troublemaker, Marvel. Alan Moore, the the the, <laughs> yeah. the 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 witch. Like he, I love the troublemakers. Like our industry, Todd McFarlane. Like the troublemakers are the ones that do good work. You know, like you need a bit of that, like shake things up. Yeah, whether it's again, whether it's like a just Neil a, Adams, Neil, a Neil Adams, man, he is a <laughs> troublemaker. I can yeah, love yeah. that. You know, because <laughs> all I mean, well, I mean, shoot, because you guys are the ones that are willing to take a character and do something to him. Like, I mean, you like your Spider Man Rain or even your manga, but like you didn't do Spider Man the way Spider Man had been done. Uh, shoot, Frank Miller took Batman and made Batman into something that now Batman is for everyone. Uh, I mean, Snyder's changed it a little bit, but like, yeah, I mean, you who, what is the other? He did the Daredevil too. Frank Miller did anyone he touched, he pretty much did that to him. Uh, I do. Here's, I think it. You know, I think it's good. Boils down to this. I think it's like it's a weird job, and you, we're all self-employed. So, what does it take to get that job? Well, you and there's very few positions, but a lot of people want to do it. So it's this weird thing <laughs> where you have to be like very independent just to want to do that job because there's no health care, there's no days off, there's no holiday pay, there's no corporate structure. There's like, you work at home in your office. So you have to be like a real individual, also have a crazy drive, and you also have to be obsessed with art. So that mix of like weirdo, <laughs> obsessive, high drive artist makes a lot of crazy people like Neil Adams and Tom McFarlane and Jim Starenko and Frank Miller and like, you know, I think it's like it just breathes like the, it. It you, you only get through the doors if you're if you're nuts. Like and yeah. that, that, the more nuts you are, the better work you 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 will be allowed to do because you can just like make it happen. Yeah, that's all. I had never. That's awesome though. But I, it makes it makes it makes me feel good that the art the guys creating this stuff I love are just as weird and awkward as we are. And oh yeah, yeah. Weird oh, yeah. That's so crazy because it's like it is like the the fans of comic books are you know we're all weirdos and then the people making them are the same people as the ones that are reading them. It's like it's like it's like a, it's a I don't know. I really also think that's why that's why okay when I when we were kids, what were the biggest movies around? Action movies, right? Mm -hmm. Arnold, yeah. Arnold, Whoa. Stallone, my boy Van Damme, yeah, uh, you know Chuck <laughs> Norris, even like like. Um, and what were the what were the crappiest movies around? Superhero movies, the Captain America movie, the Doctor, the Fantastic Four movie. Like they were wow, not. Did you just refer project. to the the Roger Corman? The Roger Corman. Yeah, I got the bootleg. You know, I got the yeah. bootleg. 
<laughs> but it's like you know those were the, the those were the worst movies around, and the best movies and the most elevated prestigious movies were action movies. And and what happens when Hollywood gets over corporatized? And you get producers growing and growing and growing. Those committees get larger and larger and larger. And then they're stagnating the stories and the screenplays. That 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 whole industry needs creative nutsos to to yeah. fill it. But they're no longer in the industry. So what happens? I don't think it's I don't think it's a coincidence that superhero movies have taken over because the best superhero movies are the ones that mine out those crazy concepts created by one or two or three guys doing a thing on a monthly grind and then they mine out the good stuff and then do that because in Hollywood there is an absence of creativity and just a it's just locked in just a lock of just people and bodies all committees everyone's everything's a committee yeah. it's so crazy so where do you find, yeah so where do you find that spark well it's not there anymore but you can find that spark in comics because complex is just attracts high product like just creative people with drive and innovation and just like I, I think that's no accident that the best movies around right now are are superhero movies, the most successful. Yeah. Well, then you throw in, uh, you guys, if you, all the it, it's amazes to us as a collector, the second someone says they're writing a book, like I'm surprised, has your book erratic before it even comes out? Had does it already gotten optioned? I um, mean, like it well, seems like that, so that book is that that that's that's an AWA uh, uh, situation. So I have some I have some. I have some, you know, involvement, but it's not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not controlling that. That's not okay. my. My image book was just me. Like yeah. I, you know, I control Renato Jones, but but erratic. That's a that's a EWA uh, okay. deal. So with image, like you actually can, like with Renato Jones, like it, I don't. It, it just fascinates to us. Like was it Dark Horse has a deal with Netflix? Boom yeah. has a deal with like every <clears> studio, <throat> and, and it's they're, right. they're, they're intertwined now. But here's the trap, right? The trap is you start to attract creators who are trying to shortcut their way into Netflix. Yeah. And yeah. I've, I've built up a separate directing career, like a, a, a separate, completely separate from comic books. Like I built up those two careers separately. Mm -hmm. So when I do directing jobs, sorry, <laughs> directing jobs, like I started by directing shorts, writing screenplays, like be like getting an agent, all based on that alone. Yeah. Comic books is completely separate. I've never like Renato Jones is not an adaptable franchise. Like it did yeah. not do that to cash in. It's like the craziest comic around. But the trap is that if a comic book creator will hit a thing, option it, it's super successful, and then other people think like, oh well, that's an easier way to do it. Maybe I can try out this comic book thing and like get my way, get myself a Netflix series by doing comic books, and then you start to attract. Uh, hacks. <laughs> you start to try people who are just looking for a shortcut, and sometimes those people are very talented, but often they're not because if they were that talented, they would have got in anyways. Yeah, they would have got into Hollywood anyways. And so, you, whenever you have a boom in comic books, you start to attract kind of weird, uh, weird people that that are there for not there for the art, not there for the stories, not there for the characters. They're there for other reasons. And one of the reasons why I'm so looking forward to a bit of a downturn, as much yeah. as I hate it, but. A, it kind of flushes out. It flushes out the people that shouldn't be in the pool. Like when in the, in the early two thousands, when there was Marvel's and bankruptcy protection, the, the all the people that were there for other reasons went away. And then you had Garth Ennis was there, and Mark Miller was there, and Joe Casada was there, and like you know, like like they were there because they loved comic books and they were really good at what they did. And you didn't have the mediocre people there looking for other things to do. Like, and I, I hate when I see a comic book and it's just a pitch for a TV series. I'll never watch. I hate yeah. it so much. Like I've, I've, I'm so averse to it. Cause when you look at, you can see it, you can see it right away. You're not like, only can you see it, it's like it's like it, it, the intention. Like I think intention creates reality, right? Like you manifest reality. I I want to marry this woman. Boom! You 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 get married. You have kids. Whatever. Like you're making that life. But if your intention is to, I want to marry the sister of this woman. I'll start by marrying her, and then I'll slowly start to infiltrate <laughs> the family, and then I'll create the corruption, and I'll go. It's like. That's not a recipe for success. <laughs> Did you just watch Hamilton? Is, it, is that why you're? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't watch it. But but I'm saying if your if your goal is to have a Netflix show, you will never create a good comic book unless your talent is so good, you by accident create a good one because you will never manifest that reality because you're focused on something else. You know, like if your goal yeah. is to play football, playing soccer isn't the way to go. 
And so when I have people tell me all the time, like, Hey, I have this screenplay and I think, I think I should do as a comic book because then maybe I can show it to people. It's like, no, don't do that. If you want to write comic books, write a comic book. If you want to sell a screenplay, find another way. Cause that's not, that's not the way to go, man. You're going to make a shitty comic book that no one likes. And it's going to make your screenplay seem like shit because no one reads shitty comic books. And maybe yeah. you can trick people once if you're platinum studios and you, trick them with an aliens versus cowboys and you sell that whole movie buff of a cover and a fake comic book that no one read. And then you buy 10,000 copies yourself and flood the stores and pretend it's the number one book. And like, you can do that once one guy can do that one time. And, but look at the movie, the movie isn't even any good yeah. because yeah. the intentions weren't pure. And I really believe it's creative people. Those pure intentions are what's needed to make successful creative projects. So you have a Frank Miller, that guy's on fire because he, loves comic books and by happenstance his movies have his comic books have translated to movies great tom mcfarlane loves comic books like jim lee loves comic books like i you know I, you can really tell when someone's like i want to do a netflix show by this comic book that no one you know I got, yeah. i'll hire some guy at a lower rate and or some yeah. person and you know i don't know i i really believe that this there will be a right before that that we hit that corner of just pure pure just people just shaking up the industry again re rebirthing the our industry that those people will go away and good and good riddance <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah it's, it's almost like i'm going who's he talking about right now i want to try to figure out like i, said, oh, no, I don't want you, i don't want you to drain yeah, drop but, anybody but there's also labels that do that like or not labels uh Oh, no, everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it because there's no many comic books. So Boom, Dark Horse, IDW, they're all they all have the Hollywood offices and they're they're playing their game. But I think there's more, I think that's more there's more legitimacy in that because um that's how it works in Hollywood. You have you have a shingle, and that shingle is always selling stuff, they're always creating stuff, they need stuff to sell. Well, why not make your own stuff? I think there's that's more legitimate. Like Stanley was pimping, um, yeah. you know, superheroes back in the in the seventies. Yeah. Like Power Rangers was suppo originally supposed to be like a superhero show, right? Marvel Comics characters. Like I think that's that's a legitimate. That's every company has to hustle and create products. And I was introduced to Spider Man by this Ralph Bakshi Bakshi sixties uh, uh, cartoon. Mm. Like, <laughs> like I have a, I have a paper cell back here. Uh, but like I think that's totally there's a company. That's but a company yeah. hires creative, and if you're getting if you're creative, and your goal is to be a company, but I don't know. It's like it's like that's that's the difference. Like I think there's there, there's a big difference. And let me tell you about someone like Mark Miller, Mark Millar, really Miller, but Millar. He's amazing, and he's he loves comic books so much, and he treats people so well. His success is, um, it's that he never went out to I'm gonna get a Netflix. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a $10 million Netflix deal or whatever. Like he was just creating, creating comics and loving comics and found some, found some, found some appetite for what he was doing in Hollywood and, and just expanded that. I think yeah. that's a legitimate way to do it, but it's more the other way where it's like someone's trying to hack that system mm. when you're not Mark Millar and they're yeah. just trying to pretend they're Mark Millar to a production company to get them to get, you know, to sell their, yeah. little book to well, now it's profitable to try to do that like <laughs> when his stuff got adapted like for wanted and whatnot like it was just comics like he wasn't trying to sell it to there was no netflix well i mean a little, a little bit right i mean wanted he like he like he he drew uh that guy as eminem and then, uh, well. and then sent out his fake press releases that eminem was interested in the role like he has a lot of that weird hustle that i love i love that like yeah. he has a, that stan lee always yeah. selling thing Tom McFarlane has the same thing that yeah. always selling. And that, I think that's, that's legitimate because it's not like, again, he's not, uh, I, th I think, he, I think his goal, he loves comics so much. His goal is to make great comics and then maybe also translate them into film and TV, yeah. but it's not like, he's not trying to like just put out the cheapest comic book he can think of to then get the Hollywood deal. Yeah. So I totally respect Mark. He's, he's amazing, huge talent. And I think he's, he's, he's helped comic books uh, a lot. So you threw. I, I want to talk about your last book because we already hit, hinted at it, and then we're we didn't talk, get this. You skipped we're, the second book. We're 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 just. But I want to talk about it because you said you My want to write down are to eating up all, all our time. <laughs> no, that that's My, no, no, life and art is better. Just... We could we could throw the game out the window. <laughs> yeah, but I did want to talk about Larry Hanna because you said you got the work of him, and then you did pick one of his books. I did not realize that this is like the only book or one of the few books that he actually drew, as well. Or oh, did yeah. he? 
He also he um he drew uh Iron Fist's second appearance. Like he he his he started as a penciler on Iron or Marvel Premiere 16. Uh, the one after Gil Kane drew the first. Fifteen was the first one, so he did. I think he did. I, I don't know. I have the I, my memories. I'm a bit muddy. Yeah, um, but Larry Hama. Well, first of all, let me tell you, my favorite comic books as a kid were GI Joe. Love yeah. GI Joe. Like I have, I only own three CGC graded books. Two, two of them are GI Joe. One's number <laughs> twenty-one. One's number one. Like I love, I love it. When I was a kid, seeing a comic book with no words like blew my mind. And these were toys I owned, so it just blew my mind. I loved it so much. And what's I find what's so interesting is I can really feel a lineage between um, this Larry Hama, Frank Miller, and Jim Steranko. And part of that lineage is like this is a book here. Uh, Master Race, try, try getting this across the border. I ordered this twice. <laughs> Custom seized it in Canada because they're like, "Oh no, that's not. <laughs> that's not what you think. It's not what you think. This is done by uh, Bernard Kriegstein, or Kriegstein, Kriegstein. Anyways, he's this uh, amazing comic artist, and he did this very Steranko pre, pre, but very Steranko esque, very Frank Miller esque tale here. And he happened to be a teacher of Larry Hama's, um, where wherever he went to art school. Huh. So this, like, look at this, the panels here, you can see here, this feels like very Steranko, this like moment to moment to moment to moment. Mm -hmm. I feel like Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And Frank yeah. Miller feels like Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And G.I. Joe number 21 feels like this kind of thing as well. Like, I think there's a real, uh, some crossover between uh, those different sources. But you know, the story of G.I. Joe number 21, right? Like they were behind, Larry Hama was just like, uh, just like when I was able to, um, pencil ink and color my first covers is because they're behind they needed it out and he's just like well i'll just i'll just draw it uh because he broke in as a pencil before he was uh before for all the stuff so okay i did not know that but uh yeah, yeah. I, lo I love it. i love it. this was this 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 book and i i had the kit i had the toys when it came out like i was reading the series like you know it really left a mark okay Pete, you're getting the shaft tonight. Do you, <laughs> Pete, let's, no, let's hear more of your book, man. Pete, what's your second book? Already got skipped when you went with your round two. You started round two. It wasn't your turn. I know. <laughs> what's your second book, Pete? What's your second book, Pete? Oh, second book. All right, fine. I'll get my second book in here. All right, my second book, and again, when you first came up with this uh, concept, or not concept, I guess the uh, the theme for uh, writer artist, I was concerned. I was like, I don't even, I can't think of anything. Like I was drawing a blank. It took me until I got back, like started thinking back older books, the 80s, and I was like, what, what can I do? Oh, okay. And I thought of Frank Miller, and you know, Mike went with that, but you know, Walt Simonson. I was yeah, like, all right, sure. yeah, I'm like, come yeah, on, that's, that's a great run. Yeah. In the artist. So this was actually, I didn't know this until now that this was his first book where he did both jobs. Like, so I went with this 337. And there's a lot of options for this for this topic. Like again, I didn't know it at first, but once I started looking into it and thinking about it, I was like, "There's a lot of things to choose from." And a lot of yeah, the, yeah. Dark Knight Returns has come up, but I couldn't find them, so uh, that's not spoiler. That's you, not my you also have a, a John oh, Byrne John Byrne Man of Steel behind your head. I noticed. I do. That's why I put it back there. It's not my pick, but I found other stuff that's writer artist behind me. This era of the '80s. Imagine this era of the '80s was was the explosion of comic books popularity, collectability, the comic book stores. Not coincidentally, also the writer artist. Yeah. Like I think, what have we done? We've like we here's what we've done. We've identified comic books and we said writers gonna write, artists gonna art, good artists gonna do covers, second tier artists gonna do the insides, best writers gonna leave comics and do, do other things. <laughs> do other things. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? It's like this weird. It's weird. Like what have we done? We've like we've like tried to. Like this really was, I think, a, created by a backlash to image where the artists were overvalued. My and my favorite artists, my favorite artists were, became overvalued, went off, they did their own thing, made millions of dollars. And the big companies were like, but never again, never again will that happen. And in, in what the, what they did, they created superstar writers. And the superstar writers are great writers, amazing writers. We've had some of the best writing we've had, but we have lost by accident, we've lost the writer artist because a writer artist. Will you, you can't have a writer artist when you have this when you, the writer is the main selling point of the book, and so I just think those those writer artists I think are, I think I, I think they're going to be around that corner again. I hope so. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I, I really, Senior they're... vision is something that's just special. Like, it, I don't know. It's different. It's a different. We vibe. had a, we had that conversation. The three of us. I guess that was yesterday. We were talking. All of a sudden, we just got into all those Copper Age books all at once, and we're like, "Oh man, I don't have Matt Wagner's Grendel. Oh, yeah, I don't have right? a James O'Barr Pro. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you know, those Concrete, kinds of books, like that, what, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and and that's what that's what I that's what I was looking at for all of mine. But I didn't I didn't own oh, it. Oh, James O'Barr, James O'Barr Crow. Right, Crow. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah that oh. guy. Love. Oh, I don't have. He he did his, he, did, he made his mark. And then he hasn't done a lot, but like, no. what a, what a mark, man. What that guy yeah, just like, oh, exactly. Loved and, then, and the, and the, the one that came to mind instantly was, was the, was, was this, which was my third one. Was <laughs> and man, I hunted the crap out of this. I never found this book when I was a kid. I wanted it so bad and I couldn't find a copy. This is only a third print. I can't afford a first print anymore, but like, this is this and, 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 and Cerebus and you brought him up earlier. Yeah, like books, books like this are just you know, and or or Sakai's uh, Usagi Yajimbo, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the that whole little cluster of books right there. And now I want them all because the, again, like you said, they, they created the whole thing. They yeah. the, it's it's the whole feeling. It's it's exactly what they wanted the the product to be. And they're like, screw it, I'll put it on newsprint. It'll be we'll do it in our copy machines at home. It'll be <laughs> crappy, but at least it'll be ours. You know, and, and we'll okay. own it. Yeah, well, well, who who else really broke this past year or two? Sean Gordon Murphy with the Bad Night awesome. Nights, like not yeah. a coincidence that he wrote in two thousand. Yeah, there's all there we go. There's also this weird. There's this. There was a recent, recent podcast by Joe with Joe Casada and Todd McFarlane. That is, you have to hunt this down. It's one of Joe Casada's drawing with Joe or whatever morning with Joe, and um, he's talking to Todd McFarlane, and Todd McFarlane goes into this rant that I just found so amazing, where he starts ranting about how. When he was drawing from Marvel Comics, everyone was drawing from plots, not full scripts. And you're mm -hmm. robbing these artists of learning how to storytell and become storytellers by making them work from full scripts. And I've never had a chance to draw from plots unless I'm writing my own stuff. And I only draw from plots. I only draw my plots and then do my storytelling panel to panel on the page, live those characters. I know I know what's happening in the page, but I live them as I'm drawing them. And I, and I think there's a real truth that and he's, he's like, you need to go back. And I, I think that's true. So yeah. I think you, you had this like Brian Bendis TV style full script thing that kind of changed the game. But I think it's, I think that's over now. I think, it's not, I think we need to go, let's go back to the plots and let these artists story tell because an artist's job is to tell the story the writer told him. And if you're trying to micromanage how that artist is going to tell that story, you're robbing his storytelling itself from the artist. So the artist only becomes this like monkey. And what can yeah. a monkey do? Not much because they're in a cage and it's a zoo and everyone's poking at them. But if you empower that artist with a, a finely crafted plot, like you will get the next Todd McFarlane. Like it's coming. Like you'll get that, that person that will then become a writer artist. I, like I like Wolverine with Chris Claremont and Frank Miller. I think that yeah. those, I think what the story goes by the last two issues, they were just phone calls they were having. And Frank Miller was drawing those last two issues based off of a phone call, something like that. Like I hmm. really, that really changed my mind about the, like, I have written for other artists and I've drawn full, I've written full scripts. Cause it's kind of a Hollywood thing, right? I write screenplays. It's like, okay, but I, my mind has changed. The next time I collaborate with an artist, it will be plot only. And I like working with writers. I really do. If it's like a Mark Miller or a Warren Ellis or Zeb Wells or whoever, like I love, talented writer that want to draw those stories. But I think the way to do it next time I do it, next time I collaborate with Warren Ellis or Mark Miller or whoever, Rick Mender, whatever, I'll, I'll ask for a plot based approach. Cause I think it's, there's some truth there that I haven't considered before. Absolutely. It makes sense. I mean, otherwise you're just storyboarding something that's just, you know, already planned out by the writer. If I want this, I want this. Well, this, let me, that, it's, the other. Here's another thing. It's like, I, like I'm whatever. I have a lot of friends and, the Hollywood or whatever. And one of them, one was a writer and he was like saying he was writing his first comic book. And he was like, he was like explaining to me how someone told him how to write a comic book and how, how he never, he never considered before, but it really is like directing when you're writing a comic book, you're the director. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Unless you're working with, with like someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Like, like that when you direct a movie, you are in charge of that production and you're making choices and you're informing that. But, but when you're writing a comic book, if you're doing those jobs, that are you can, like if you if, if I'm telling someone how to build a house, 
I don't know how to build a house. I can tell them what I want. I kind of want this. I kind of want that. But if I'm trying to tell the architect how to draw the plans and the builders how to hammer the wood together, like that house will fall over. And I think, yeah. I think there's a misinterpretation of what a comic book writer is today because comic book writers are a bit overvalued at the moment. And again, I think it there will be a, a return to normalcy like around the corner. Nice. Ranting, ranting. <laughs> it's good. These are great rants. These are great. Listen, I, think, great. I, think, I, I think I think the future of comic books is is bright. It's dazzling, and and this momentary dip we're going to have, and it's going to get a bit worse when we come out of it. I just I just feel like it's like it. Whatever happens next is going to be like every every twenty years, comic books almost die. Right, we mm -hmm. almost died in the '60s, and then Marvel came along. We almost died in the '80s, and then comic stores came along. We almost died in the 2000s, and then Marvel had the had the revolution, like the, with the image. Like we die, we almost die every 20 years, and right now we're in the almost dying part. But, yeah. but like the only thing, like that that, that whole like um, like we, you need a metaphorical rebirth to live, right? You need yeah. to like live that life, make good choices, have your life explode go through the suffering enter the darkness like live in death and like experience despair like you, that's just life you yeah. need to dip down there if you're not dipping down there you're not human but the dip the deeper you go <laughs> the more energy you have to come back up like that wheel and i think we're about here we're gonna go here and then we're gonna come back out on top like i think you if you don't have the death you don't have the life like you just need that yeah that's what i tell myself every time Jeez. i fail at a cover <laughs> Kari, Kari, I think I think maybe com get rid of stop comic books, stop movies. I think you need to be an inspirational speaker. To be honest with you. <laughs> You're riveted. I'm going. I want to write a novel now. I'm going to write a third album. I'm going, to, I'm going to write a comic book. Forget it. <laughs> but I think the lesson, the the real lesson is like, and you learn this. You learn this when you draw. Is like it's failure is just part of the deal. Like you need to embrace. Like it needs. Like I I firmly believe if there's no suffering in the job, there's no magic. Like why? That's why you, there's always these covers. And you just struggle, struggle. It's not working. It's not working. Sometimes they just die, but oftentimes, like the suffering, kind of it imbues that cover with the magic that will make it good. And if you're not suffering through it and putting yourself into corners and like and finding problems and like fixing it as you're doing it, like if you if that's not embodied in in the art that's what you call a hack, right? If you're just hacking it out with no passion, the passion yeah. is embodied in the suffering. Like passion is suffering in a, in a way, just like, like for instance, you will never hurt someone more than the people you love because it's embodied in that process. And you will never love someone more than the person you've hurt the most. Like, and if you can survive it, that's just called marriage, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I need to give you my wife's phone number and you need to tell her that, please. If you wouldn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, all you had to do is hit play and just watch this one segment. I promise you. It's please. I'm gonna send it to her. I'm gonna send it to her as a, uh, I'm gonna send it to her as like a little mini movie. Be like, just it'll play over and over and over and over again. <laughs> you know, I love comics. I love comics so much because it's like I really do think it's like one of the only mediums left where you can have so much creative creativity. That's not moderated by some committee. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not a TV. A TV show is like there's a room of writers, there's like network executives, there's product producers, it's like blah 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 blah. Well, Move, yeah, movies yeah. are like the same thing. Not novels, maybe there's about the same in novels, but there's no visual side of novels. So it's like the only medium left where you can be you can have an artistic narrative experience from single source creators. I don't I don't think there's anything else. Hmm. Yeah, I, so I was like, I want to argue, but I don't have an argument for you. <laughs> uh, but Akari, thank you for joining us. Uh, I, we don't want to really? take any more of your time. We love talking and everything. Uh, you've, I mean, you've inspired us. Mike's gonna go write a novel and convince his wife that you're God. And uh, <laughs> maybe no, not God. Just, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Kari convince my wife that I'm a God. Oh, oh okay, God, right. no, no. <laughs> but uh, thanks for joining us uh, on Never gonna Money. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Did we, did we make it through everyone's books? Thank you. Uh, we kind of lost track of the books. Yeah, actually, wait, 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 we got to talk about my last, my last one quick before we go. Yeah. Uh, uh, we Electra, about it, Electra oh, yeah. lives again quickly. Quickly, Electra lives again because 
I need to tell you just one quick thing. The coloring in this book is next level. This pan painted coloring is the thing that someone needs to do again right now. Cause it's, <laughs> it has, it's, it, it, it was like a flash fire. It happened once poof. And then it didn't, never happened again. But this book is so influential, not just to me, but to like so many artists. And it's like that wildfire that happened once. It's just waiting for someone to do again. So let's, let's make that happen. Friends. Someone. <laughs> someone. I'll, I'll make sure I drop some images of the interiors here. Like, I can I can edit in some stuff after the fact. That's amazing. I mean, one of my favorite visual visual experiences of all time is, is that book. See, and that's interesting because that's not when I think of Electra and Frank Miller, like this book in my mind doesn't pop as the yeah, first I one. I always I always think of the sync covers and that that run. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Well, because when this book came out, it was like super expensive. It was in this weird mm -hmm. format. I only stumbled across it by accident. I was probably twelve again, or what? I don't know how old I was, but I was too young to buy it. But <laughs> somehow I somehow I think I just convinced my mom to give me extra money or something like that. I somehow got my hands on it. Uh changed my life for sure. For sure. Now I'm gonna have to go check it out. I'll, I'll, I'm, looking, I don't at, think I'm I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> yeah. But but so let's go. Thank you again. Okay. Uh we, we hit your books. Uh <laughs> it, I, I just love the stories. Uh you yeah. The, I love watching guys. Uh, Kari has a, po a podcast he does. Uh, what's it called? Well, it's like I was, I'm dabbling in the YouTube. Easy. I'm very inconsistent. And when I'm at, like, so it's like every now and then I'll throw up a thing seen by tens of people. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of those tens. I've, I right, love right. you when you went, through an, you, you went through and analyzed Todd McFarlane, the, the Cosada thing you were talking about. You analyzed it. Yeah, I, I was like, that. that's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can see that. You can see that. You can see that video. I, you can see the video. I've, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just experimenting because I, I find myself watching so much YouTube right now as I'm drawing. It's replaced TV. So <laughs> I feel an urge to poke around it, but it's weird because I, I feel, oh, I feel weird because I only want to talk about comics, but I draw comics and I only want to talk about movies, but I work in that field too. Yeah, so it's like, that too. So it's, uh, I'm trying to figure out like how to deal with it, but you know, so I mean, hey, th this fun. is my outlet right here. Talking comics because my wife could care less that, it, that yeah. I collect <laughs> comics. So yeah. like, finally Same I have three people, four people and I'm by an artist who can tell me, no, you're full of crap. This is actually what I did. Um, <laughs> yeah. so to, to find my little YouTube experiment, just, 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 uh, you YouTube search my name and something will pop up. I'll drop it right here. Oh, there we go. So, so yeah, thanks. Thanks again. This is three comic money. Uh, on comicbookinvest.com tales from flip side guys so yeah. we really appreciate your time thank thanks you so much. i had a great time really. guys thanks let's do it again yes